You're listening to the Corbett Report. This is James Corbett, and you're tuned into CorbettReport.com on this 13th of April, 2010. Today, I'm honored to be joined on the line by an icon of online whistleblowing, John Young. Uh, Mr. Young founded Cryptome.org in 1996, and for the last 14 years has been publishing the documents that the government does not want you to see. Uh, John Young, it's a pleasure to have you on the program. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me today. Pleasure to be with you. Well, Mr. Young, I wanted to draw on your experience tonight to talk about WikiLeaks, an organization that's getting an awful lot of attention now with their collateral murder video. But uh, before we get into that, perhaps it would be beneficial to make sure that everybody's on the same page. So could you tell us a little bit about your background, how you came to start Cryptome.org, and what your site is all about? The site was set up to publish information about cryptography and other forms of communication security. I joined a, a mail list called Cypherpunks. It was composed of engineers and scientists who deal with cryptography. And they were working uh, either in universities or with corporations dealing with encryption. And they knew it was going to be declassified and put into the public domain. And they wanted to get the information they knew out to the public so the public would know what was coming uh, about um, uh, protecting their own communications on the Internet and uh, off the Internet. And so they had a strong uh, belief in making this kind of information public, which had been secret for centuries. So we thought that was something we'd like to help with. So we set up a website to publish that because we had no involvement with the topic at all before. We're architects in New York City, but we're strong believers in freedom of information. So we decided to run the site and put up material they sent to us. So, so what is your site's philosophy? Is, is there information that you come across that you, you ever refrain from publishing? Only information that seems to be, uh, in our modest opinion, uh, uh, and by the way, we have a very wide, open mind about what's nutty and what's not and what's valid and what's not, so we, we seldom not publish anything. And in fact, it's so seldom, I'd, had, I'd be hard-pressed to say that we hadn't published something. One thing we try not to do is probably something that's been widely published elsewhere. And after we got a, had been around for a while, we found that people were sending stuff to us that sent to a hundred other sites. So we're, we would like to publish stuff that's hard to find or hard as you can't get anywhere else if we can do that. But of course, we never know for sure. So we try to keep up with that. Well, that's right. And, but, and but you I do it. Say is that, I'm sorry. I just want to say that uh, anything that the government doesn't want published, we'd like to help get published just as a matter of principle. That's right, and, and you do an admirable job of, of doing that with uh, several new documents being posted pretty much every day. And uh, uh, Cryptome.org has certainly had an interesting history in the last decade and a half, and you've weathered uh, the storms of many a DCMA takedown notice and well-publicized battles with Microsoft and Yahoo and other uh, tech giants, although you always seem to bounce back even stronger than before. What do you attribute your success to, given that there are so few others out there who are able to maintain an operation like this for so long? Well, my sense is that uh, we don't know very much about what we're doing. Uh, Therefore, we do stuff and get away with it because people who are more knowledgeable and smarter wouldn't do what we're doing. In fact, our, our lawyer from other fields say, you shouldn't be doing this, Mr. Young, but if you get in trouble, I'm here for you. So we just ignore him. And so I think that the reason most people don't do this is they think they might get in legal or financial trouble for doing so. And since we are the sole party that pays for our site, we don't have to worry about donors or uh, making money or anything like that. So as far as you can tell, that's the main difference is that we don't do it for commercial reasons. We pay it for ourselves and we don't have anyone to be accountable to. And since we have no resources to be sued for, there's no reason to sue us. The only open question is, would the government ever shut us down? And so far, no. Well, it is an important point that you raise about uh, resources and funding, and one that I guess uh, will touch on the topics that we're going to be talking about tonight. And as I alluded to at the beginning of our conversation, I I wanted to get you on today to talk specifically about a website that that many people might assume at first glance you would have an affinity with, and that is WikiLeaks.org. And what many people may not know is that you were, in fact, one of the people that the WikiLeaks group contacted when they were starting out and looking for the support of more established figures to lend themselves a little more weight and credibility. But your connection with the group did not last very long. Tell people about how you came to be contacted by WikiLeaks and what ultimately transpired from that. We were contacted to be the 
the named owner of the site, because uh, every site has to have a named owner with the registry of websites. And they needed someone who would be willing to put their name out there, and so because they didn't want to use any of their names, and so I agreed to do that. And by the way, I should say uh, uh, we've we've helped foster several dozen such sites like ours. So WikiLeaks has come to prominence, but there are a slew of other sites doing what Krypton does out there, and we're happy to to encourage and foster that any way we can. So how long did your, your contact with the group last, and how did it end? Uh, it was just a few weeks, because in discussing, and this is before the site had opened, it was just it was a private mail just discussing what to do and how to go about it. At some point, there was a discussion about raising funds, and someone mentioned a very large number. I think it was about $5 million that they wanted to aim at. And I protested that, saying that, well, I thought you should operate a year or two before you talk about those kind of numbers, because if you're going to try to raise that kind of money, that means you're probably up to no good if you have no reputation yet. And that didn't sit well uh, with the group. And so they, we got into an argument about that. And I said, I think I'll part company with you, which I did. That's right. And and that's I, I, among certain circles, I guess, a rather famous incident, uh, specifically because you published all of your con- correspondence with WikiLeaks on Krypton.org, including uh, messages from their general mailing list. So what prompted you to do that? Well, one is that they they were giving me some grief about um, uh, being uncooperative, and the other was that they were ignoring my saying that at some point you're going to be penetrated and that you're going to be leaked about what you're doing. So this whole attention to think that you can hide who you are and what you're up to is impossible on the Internet. I said that there's no way you can not at some point become known. And so I gave them an example of that. Uh, yes, you and certainly by the way, did. we don't believe in... in and keeping ourselves secret from the world. We think that people who run sites like this need to be known, and we put our home address and telephone number up the first day we set up our site. So we've always been completely open about who we are so that you can verify who we are. And so their attempt to hide who they are uh, didn't sit well with me, particularly their, their, their fundraising ambition. I thought that was something I didn't want to be associated with. Well, that's right. It's a combination of things uh, that that seems to to raise suspicion, in, including, of course, uh, trying to so desperately to hide identities, but also the the fundraising and a number of different factors come into play. Um, ha- had you had any contact with these people personally, or was it all electronic? It was all by email. And d- did you know any of them before they were involved in WikiLeaks? Uh, there were a couple of names I recognized. Uh, I don't know if they're still involved or not. Um, because it looks as though, in addition to me, there were a number of other people involved in in uh, uh, the, the technology the internet who who they must have uh, well and obviously did invite to take part because some of them took part in the email discussions others others of them were just named but didn't seem to take part and so uh, um, but none of those people had I met since I'm based in New York and people are scattered all over the world. I often don't know the people I'm dealing with and don't need to know. And so we made a big point about making ourselves known, but we also offer anonymity to our our contributors. And so we don't believe that you should name your contributors, but you should at least name who you are and what you're up to. But there are different opinions about that. And by the way, I think WikiLeaks has done a a fabulous job of what they set out to do. Uh, They obviously haven't raised as much money as they were aiming at or if they're telling the truth about that, but they've certainly mm-hmm. done a, a lot of good work in releasing uh, controversial information, and so I'm a supporter of what they're doing, even if I don't always agree with all their tactics. Right, exactly. So so let's talk about what they've been doing in recent years. What what have they done that has either allayed or inflamed your suspicions? Well, they stuck with it, and they fought like hell, and they've got some good stuff out there that um, I would doubt that Krypton would have ever gotten. Uh, maybe we would have, maybe we wouldn't, or some other site would have gotten in. So they've, they've managed to certainly publicize themselves. They're very good at, uh, at promoting WikiLeaks as an entity. Uh, and so um, I, I think that, uh, in fact, they're almost unique in promoting the leakage as a product. And so they're very good at that and boosting interest in it. And by demonstrating that, they've gotten a lot of people send them stuff. Um, and so... Um, I commend them for that because the more people know about how you can get information out into the public domain, the better. Uh, I just think there should be hundreds of WikiLeaks out there and not a, not a single highly branded name. But that's okay. It'll come along. 
Right, exactly. Well, well, that's an astute point because it, it strikes me from, uh, at least from the release of the uh, Collateral Murder video, that the entire setup to this and, and the pr- presentation of it, it seems like one extended PR campaign for WikiLeaks itself, and it seems to have been fabulously, amazingly successful in that regard. And from what I've read from the press, they've uh, received $160,000 in donations just since the release of that video. So obviously working on that front, and it does seem like they are marketing a product of, of leakage and and they are uh, the, the company to offer it so it's it's an interesting idea but it does i think tend to arouse suspicions in certain ways uh obviously thinking it, whenever it comes down to money and resources obviously we're, we're looking at who is funding this and and in what form well yeah and of course all they're using is a model of journalism journalism is a how to do what you feel uh, as well as media in general. So there's nothing to be ashamed of in what they're doing. So it's a model that's well established out there, and the and the Internet is being used heavily for this, from Google to Microsoft to whatever. So that WikiLeaks is actually more normal than abnormal in seeking uh, to raise funds online for a, a special kind of service. And, of course, all the newspapers uh, grab each other's material. Uh, and so it's a common thing that they're doing out there. And, of course... The newspapers have been using leakage as a branding product for decades now, and so WikiLeaks is just sharp enough to capitalize upon it. And so it's unique in that it brings attention to uh, leakage as a product rather than as you know honest, reliable information. Leakage is an artificial uh, product, as you know. Well, that's that's right. In fact, that's an extremely important point because when we think of it, uh, leakage is is that form of journalism known as the the big scoop, which is of course what every what every journalist is waiting for is that big scoop that will make their name. And WikiLeaks and and sites like this seem to be relying on scoops, which is obviously what leaks are really at first. So it it, it seems like it's a, a way of trying to, I guess, constantly. Uh, keep up the the level of hype uh, surrounding the the information itself, and and not in a negative way necessarily, but it, it's relying on that as as almost a business model. Yeah, in fact, the U.S. government is the biggest leaker in the world, and they use it for precisely that reason: is they 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 inflate the value of, of what they leak to make it seem important to get people's attention and to shape public perception of what government does. Of course, corporations do the same thing. So this kind of um, of spending information as kind of lurid and appealing and somewhat unsavory is is part of the brand, and so that's done. Uh, you know, celebrities do it. Uh, maybe we all do it in our own way, as we kind of you know tell tall stories. And so leakage is just one one of those manifestations, and WikiLeaks has been smart enough to capitalize upon that. And I think that's why some people who also deal in leakage are a little bit annoyed that WikiLeaks is put their own brand at risk as not being good enough. So I think that's why I say it's a good step. Because some of the leakage that's called leakage is not terribly interesting and not terribly important. Of course, it's leaked to 100 outlets at the same time. And so to up the, up the ante is a good thing. Right. Well, well, certainly we know this even from from sort of mundane journalism that leaks happen all the time for strategic reasons when an administration wants certain facts to come out in a certain way but don't want to be seen to be saying it. So we know that this is uh, something that happens on, on a very routine basis. And uh, so in, in that sense, it's, well, it's not really add, unique. It's not just government. Uh, corporations do it. Individuals do it. Um, it when individuals do it, it's sometimes called nasty gossip, but it's the same thing. And, you know, it's a huge market for that. And so we shouldn't restrict this to government. Uh, I'm not sure government even invented the term. Uh, churches do it. Universities do it. They, they may call it something else, but the, but the format is certainly obviously the same. It's just inflating the value of something by the way you describe it. And by the way, we don't. We stopped using the term some time back because we saw that it was uh, not terribly meaningful anymore. So we just say, well, we have some documents here. Uh, we, we feel the same way about the term whistleblower. It's gotten over abused, and of course, there are paid whistleblowers out there, just like there are paid spinners and leakers. So we find it all fascinating as it evolves into overloading the market with whistleblowing and leaks and spin and looking for new ways for this to be done. 
Very important point. Yes, we have to, we have to, I guess, differentiate the information itself from the uh, emotional baggage of the semantic terms that it's loaded with. So, so certainly just taking out, out those terms from the equation will help with that. But um, I guess the question that some people out there will have about this is that we, we know it's the, the bad guys, if you will, in government and in the corporatocracy and in uh, many different aspects of society who are seeking to veil their work uh, behind the, the screen of, of secrecy. And, and in that sense, I think we have this image of people who are bringing us uh, documents that are being suppressed as uh, doing an unequivocal good. And I, it's important to, to understand the ways in which this process can be used for nefarious purposes. So, so let's expand a little bit on that point. Okay. Uh, is that uh, leakage is, is bred by secrecy. And so the evildoer here are, are the people who, who believe in secrecy because they're the ones who do the leakage. If there was no secrecy, there could be no leakage. And so you can't have leakage without secrecy. And so that's, the, that, that's what contaminates the food source. And so um, we have to be anti-secrecy in all of its forms, governmental, institutional, personal, unless you've got some legitimate thing. But as a policy, it shouldn't be done. It's certainly not by governments or a democratic government. It shouldn't. And so leakage is one response to that. Of course, the the corollary of that is that those who love secrets love to leak their own version of the secrets, and they're masters at that. And they do it very persuasively. You know, they can start a war with it, or in one for that matter, or bring down an administration if they want to. So the institution of secrecy is, is what is not looked at close enough uh, compared to looking at leaks. Is I think leaks are very minor compared to the to the corrupting uh, and anti-democratic effect of too much secrecy around the world, not just within the U.S. And of course, this is a very uh, and this is a very long-lived practice. This didn't start in the modern era; it's been around for centuries. Well, well, that's exactly right. I mean, uh, obviously, what we're fighting is that that culture of secrecy through which information is suppressed. And if there was no suppression of knowledge, then there could be no leakage. So, uh, basically, the leakage is fighting against uh, the, the the suppression of uh, of information. But um, so, so I guess, bottom line, then, how would you assess uh, assess the WikiLeaks group? Are are they crooks or attention seekers or idealists are they are they an organization that's been infiltrated by intelligence are they puppeteered by intelligence are they a stalking horse for soros and people of his ilk or if i've missed out any possibilities please feel free to insert well all those are certainly possible and it's it's a good question is how many of them apply and so it wikileaks is to be praised for at least raising those issues which shouldn't be restricted to WikiLeaks. It should be uh, applied to any source of information that comes to the public, uh, newspapers, church, universities. Those questions should be asked of all what I call authoritative sources. All authoritative sources should be questioned the way WikiLeaks is being questioned, and they're not. And they, in fact, they peddle authoritativeness, uh, and they talk about context and broader picture and authentication and all these kind of fancy terms. But in the end, what they want is to sell off being an authoritative source. And it's rather large business uh, to sell authoritativeness, verifiability, and stuff like that. So WikiLeaks, I think, uh, is saying, ah, so you thought you were the only one who could peddle that. What's this? And so uh, we, next to secrecy, authoritativeness is the most damaging thing to an open society. And it gets few attacks. Of course, they, they mildly attack each other, but by and large, authoritative support each other. Now, this is authoritative, not authoritarians. That's different. These are just authoritative, and they can be from any field or any walk of life. People who want to tell you what's what and how to think about it. Right. Well, well certainly we, we've seen uh, the recent attacks on, on uh, or supposed attacks on WikiLeaks, I suppose, from the, from the Pentagon, according to WikiLeaks' own leaked documents about uh, how the Pentagon wants to try to undermine the credibility of WikiLeaks as a way of, of damaging them. And, and credibility almost becomes a type of currency for these types of organizations then. Yeah, but having read that report, of course, it's a very mild attack. Uh, is that uh, a number of things they're accusing WikiLeaks of, you could accuse 100 newspapers of or 100 university researchers of. Or, uh, and so that it was, um, it was almost like it was promotional material that was leaked to WikiLeaks on purpose to boost its reputation. It was so mild in its attack. Uh, and so that, um, uh, and by the way, secret information is leaked all the time. And this thing was called secret, I think, to, to glamorize it. 
Top secret material is leaked all the time. Both of those terms are throwaway classifications now. The really secret stuff doesn't even use those terms anymore. In fact, they use terms that we don't even know what they are, but top secret and secret is now are now red herrings. Right. So well, we it came out... Asked, uh, I'm sorry? I, I was just going to say it came out two or three weeks before the collateral murder video and generated headlines all around the world for WikiLeaks just at the time when they needed them. So, yeah, I think there might have been some strategy. Someone did them a favor. Uh, and by the way, I'm not knocking that. I'm saying you work with what you've got. Uh, Absolutely, so you, yes. you welcome these opportunities. But the question uh, is... If, I, I believe, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but they, they say that they're sitting on uh, one million plus documents or something like that, and they're they're only releasing the ones that they can, given the resources that they have. So obviously this document was selected at that time to come out in that way as a promotional event. Well, that's normal behavior in the world of communication, as you know. Apple just did it. You know, they practiced secrecy and then sprung this product on us. And so... Um, and, um, you know, an exaggeration of what you've got waiting to be released is also pretty common. Um, all the intelligence agencies do it. All governments talk about what they're withholding for the protection of the public. So none of these terms are unusual and are not distinctive to WikiLeaks. In fact, it's good normal behavior for for getting your material to be noticed. And I'm, I assume that, that, that astute observers of, of what's called the management of information flow are well aware of what I'm saying because, you know, we didn't cook this up on our own. We just watch what people say. Uh, and so these are fairly well-known. In fact, I sometimes joke that WikiLeaks' main model is Rupert Murdoch, who's been using these exact same techniques for several decades now and done very well at it. Well, I guess in a positive sense, rather than looking at the negative side of this, in a positive sense, thinking about the way that a, a, a website like this could be built or structured, is there a way to, to build something like this that, that does not invite the speculation about the nefarious things that are going on behind the curtain? I doubt it, because it comes with, a, with, that, with that brand of product. Controversy is what it thrives on. As you know, that's why the various media are always attacking each other. And Murdoch, again, is a classic example. If you don't have controversy, you're not going to be noticed. Sad as that may be, you better have some controversy or people are going to move on to something that does have more appeal to it. So that's why you see all this fake controversy popping up. I mean, and I'm not being cynical. I'm just saying these are techniques that are well established in the world of um, public information. And so WikiLeaks has, has done a very good job of competing with Facebook and LinkedIn and Google and others who also use the same techniques, which is to make it appealing in some way. So they just happen to have chose this particular brand, and I think it's a good thing because uh, the so-called established or the so-called reputable media have been exploiting these techniques for a long time, acting like they're doing a, great, a fantastic public service, but in fact they got kind of fat and lazy. They don't break many news stories anymore. Well, certainly, I, I guess you, you must speak from experience about, about that, because obviously your site has received a great deal of attention during times when it's uh, being taken down or being threatened to be taken down, but uh, probably not as much attention at other times. So I'm sure That's it's right. just... And, and so I just point out, we, it's a model for our work as a library, uh, not a blog, not a sensationalist site. And 90% of what we publish is completely non-controversial. It's still about government and operation of government and other nefarious activities, but it's not headline-making stuff. And so that's, that's our model as a library. You go there and you read, you think about it for yourself. We don't tell you what to think. We just make stuff available. But the media is always telling you what to think because they're, they're selling a product, including advertising. So since we don't have any commercial goals here, we don't need to pump it up. And so is we like the library model and, and not the marketing model. So what do you think about the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative and the idea of creating a safe harbor for these types of documents? Again, a step in the right direction. They're going to go through some growing pains. They're going to get some attacks. They're going to get some ridicule. That's okay. It's a step in the right direction. And hopefully other countries will follow their lead. Someone's got to do it better than we're doing now because there's been so much suppression of information about government and corporate activity around the world, uh, which I call the China model, in which we think they're, they're, they're the only ones doing it when in fact it's very common. So we need to reverse that. And so you start somewhere with a small country, 
um, and see if you can bill from that seed corn. But they might get cream, they might not, they might pull it off. So I'm hopeful that they'll pull it off because it has to start somewhere. Right now there's, because of, of electronic communication that's now worldwide, is there's so much uh, ways in which that can be controlled through the people that operate the system, through the companies who sell tools to use it, whether it's computers or software, are those who sell you know, the, the networking stuff. And by the way, all those folks have admitted to being part of this hegemon, if to use a corny term, is that there's so many easy ways to control it that you need someone to oppose it just as a matter of principle. So I'd like to see Iceland pull it off. It's too bad America can't do that, but that's its brand that they've let down. You know, we once were the leader in freedom of information, now we're the leader in secrecy and leakage, I mean, orchestrated leakage. So we've lost a, a lot of reputation um, in the last few decades because of our obsession with secrecy and so-called threats to national security, which is a, a nonsense term. Whipped out every time you raise any issue, threat to national security is the answer. Exactly. And and so, so do you see that as being, uh, I guess, a, a planned takedown of, of the United States and its uh, reputation for freedom of information? Well, what it should do is at least call their bluff uh, and say, if you really believe in freedom of information, you will lift all this obnoxious secrecy and your, and your scare stories about spying on the Internet and hackers doing this and China doing that. You'll stop this nonsense, all of which have turned out to be phony, baloney, every time they're exposed as being spin doctoring. And then we'll eventually get around to, well, what is the true threat to national security rather than the manufactured kind? Because there's a huge industry now of exploiting the term, the term threat of national security. That's a brand name. And there are huge fortunes made off of that brand name, mostly covert, often protected by secrecy. And you cannot get at it. It's almost like a religion, national security now. Right. Well, that that obviously goes back to the the military industrial complex, which has seamlessly morphed into the terror industrial complex. And uh, I don't know how we would go well, about dislodging that. I call it uh, actually the information complex. And I think military industrial complex, as you know, is a hoary term. And that again, even the military industrial people will whip that out every now and then. Uh, when in fact, what they're doing is is managing information. I, I think that's exactly right. In fact, I'm currently working on an article about the military information complex because I think that's absolutely the key to it. And the control of information is is not only has been important for decades, but of course is is becoming more and more important and, and growing exponentially. So, so on that note, let's change gears a little. While I have you here, I would be very interested to draw on your knowledge and your experience with the electronic surveillance grid to talk about the recent developments in the NSA wiretapping case. And as I'm sure that you know, uh, and I'm, I imagine many of my listeners know, uh, just two weeks ago, the federal district court judge Vaughn Walker in San Francisco ruled that the NSA wiretapping program is, of course, illegal and was illegal under Bush and is continuing to be illegal under Obama. And uh, that uh, I, I think a lot of people know about the NSA wiretapping program and the details that have come out regarding that, but not not as many people are aware of, I think, the, the broader history of, of that um, and just this I think last week it, a new memo emerged uh, detailing the fact that the uh, Ford administration had authorized warrantless wiretapping back in 1974. So this is absolutely nothing new. And I think a lot of people don't really understand uh, some of the legislative framework for this, uh, things like the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act of 1994. So uh, tell us a little bit about the, the broader history of, of this type of surveillance. Well, uh, we've got something called a timeline of, uh, of this kind of work, and uh, we at least traced it back to the middle of the 19th century, and it had to do with using of technology to communicate rather than, you know, handwritten notes or, or couriers, and it came in first with uh, telephone wires or telegraph wires, and it started immediately to, uh, to spy on people through this technology by various kinds of taps. Uh, and, it, and so that timeline is on, uh, is on Krypton. And because uh, that one of the first things we learned from these specialty engineers that this had been around a long time, it's just that it had been kept secret. So we decided to put that up. So the, the NSA thing is certainly not new to anyone involved in, in communication security. It's been going on in the U.S. Uh, actively since the First World War and probably before through various kinds of techniques used in the American Civil War. And so... Uh, 
sometimes it's legal, sometimes it's illegal. I know the stuff that was done during the, the First World War was done by agreements between the telephone, the international telephone companies and the predecessor to NSA. They just had a gentleman's agreement to do it uh, because, quote, there was a war on. And so it's gone through several iterations of illegality and legality. Uh, meanwhile, governments do what they want, period, uh, and let the lawyers figure it out later if they're caught or not caught. So this being caught out west, uh, the spying, we assume is a red herring. They often let little projects be caught to cover up bigger ones. And so and they fight like hell in court against it. And that's all part of the glamorization of the leakage. So that was a form of leakage that took place with NSA out there. I think they intended to be caught and it was meant to cover up what they're actually doing. So we'll wait and see. Uh, listen, these are just standard techniques. I'm not being conspiratorial. These are standard techniques well known in the communication security field. You're always deceiving people as much as you can and you never tell them what you're really doing. And you always pretend that you've been caught. Exactly. And I think I think my listeners will probably understand that by now if they've listened to this program for any length of time. But uh, but certainly I, I, I think that at one level on which that that cover up or limited hangout might be taking place is simply the uh, uh, obscuring the fact that, uh, for example, back in uh, 2004, uh, there was an AT&T whistleblower, to use that term, who uh, revealed the the fact that, uh, which was really just part of Cali Act compliance, that AT&T had the back doors, uh, that the NSA was splitting off uh, the data and copying it wholesale uh, without any type of warrant and without any type of discernment or filtering and just data mining all of the data coming in through that telecommunications hub, uh, NSA just working out of the back door. And, and to me, that's part of the, the larger picture, although I'm sure there are much, much larger operations going on that we, we really have no access to whatsoever. But what, what other stories or what other aspects of this do you think might be important to, to follow up on? Well, as our current initiative is on this, um, what you mentioned is that the, the use of commercial firms to spy on the Internet. Uh, and so that uh, we published about some 40 what we call spying guides put out by corporations where they describe either one, their privacy policies, that always has an exception for complying with law enforcement requests, or what they call third parties that are unidentified. And under CALEA that you mentioned, they have to provide user data to law enforcement and these other uh, unidentified parties. And so they, and they also get paid for this because CALEA, as you may recall, set up a very large fund. First initially it was 500 million, and it subsequently sub, uh, added to to pay these corporations for providing the service. So they now use it as a money maker. However, they freely admit they don't want their users to know this because it would, as they say, ruin our reputation in some of the so-called leaked documents. So they classify them as either copyrighted or confidential and withhold them from the public, and they use privacy policy as a cover for this. And so we now publish these firms' privacy policy as a clue that they're deceiving you and point out where within that policy the deception is taking place. And um, it is... There is no place to on the internet to escape being spied on. So WikiLeaks can be tracked very easily, as can their contributors. And we've always told our users that it's, it's not something we Krypton can control. You know, there are 30 points of access to material coming to us and going from us that you can get access to our activities. And that's just the nature of the internet. It's a very open system, and any open system will be used to spy on the citizenry. Now, I should say, the folks who are doing this don't call it spying. They call it data gathering. But the people who are victims of it should call it what it is. It's called you're spying on us. They don't like that term. They call it data gathering. Right. Keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. And by the way, so, they sell this stuff to each other, too. So Microsoft gets it from Google. Google uh, sells it to Cisco. Cisco sells it to ATT. Uh, and so it's a pretty thorough um, uh, system of exchanging information because it's a liberty market. Then, of course, that lets to advertisers, and that gets some attention. But that um, 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 advertisers, you know, of course, are a sleazy group, which we all love because they pay us. Uh, is that? But the real uh, hazard of this exchange of user data is that they can refine their systems to do more of it without us knowing. And so they swap techniques almost as though the 
uh, you know, the Baptists were swapping information with the Methodists or whatever. Just how do you do it? What, what's working better? Let's, let's, let's share our tips. So the spies exchanged spying information under guise of fighting each other. And so these corporations, in, under guise of competing with each other, share information on what users are up to. And, of course, they sell it to governments, and governments share this stuff. So we find it fascinating to try to figure out how to do this now because we're not helpless in all this. You, too, can work back through this information, as we've been able to do, and see where it's coming from and what it's used for because these, these large organizations can't control their own organization. <laughs> hmm. You know, the damn spreak a leak back to that cliche. Hmm. Some aggrieved right. employee decides, I'm going to get back at so-and-so. And so we open information sites and get the benefit of that. Exactly. And if I recall correctly, it was the publication of a, a spying gu guide from Microsoft that, that raised their ire enough to get Cryptom.org taken down briefly. Well, it was, it was, uh, it was bureaucratic ire because uh, under the DMCA, uh, they can just file a copyright violation notice with an ISP uh, and... Uh, if we, of course, they did against us for their spying guide, and we refused to take it down. And so our ISP automatically shut our site. There was no human intervention. That's required by law to do those exact steps. And so uh, had there not been a public outcry about it, we would still be shut down or moved to another ISP, which is what we would do. But because there's an outcry, Microsoft canceled its copyright claim. And right. that's not often done. They often use copyright for this censorship rule. And the document, though, we said was actually beneficial public information and that it had no right to copyright. And we've since seen a legal defense of that, saying that Microsoft was legally wrong to have objected to this document being out there because it had public benefit. But these abusers of power often do this. They overreach. Well, they certainly they certainly do at times, and uh, it, it as much as the, the America is becoming known for for its secrecy rather than its freedom of information, it still does have the strong legislative history of freedom of speech and protection of the press, the constitutional protections, which are, are to some extent only words on paper and are only as good as the uh, the people that are upholding them. But um, there is still that at least precedent in that history uh, which flows through America. And speaking as a Canadian, obviously we we don't really have that same level of protection of freedom of speech. So I think that's uh, something to work from at any rate and uh, work towards for, for the rest of the world. Um, uh, well, I guess uh, moving from, from that point, uh, do you keep an eye on the, on the legislative side of things with development of, of new uh, legislative uh, proposals and, and things that uh, might be the precursor or the next step from D DMCA and Cali Act and things like that? Or, or do you simply publish and, and ask questions later? No, I, I do a fair amount of research on topics that, that we try to keep up with. And so while we don't watch everything that's going on in the government, we watch out for those. So we are on. We go to our favorite sites and look around and see what's up, and then we wait for people to point out stuff that we've missed. And as you may know, there's a new initiative out now called Digital Due Process. Have you heard of the term? I have not. Okay, it's one set up about a week ago by about 40 of the major uh, um, Internet uh, firms, telecoms, Google, Microsoft, a whole batch of them have gotten together with about a, a dozen nonprofits who are interested in public information. They set up this initiative called Digital Due Process. There's a website by that name, singleword.org, and they're they're proposing that the uh, that the Standing Electronic Communications Act be revised and updated to fit today's technology because it's way out of date. And so they're um, hoping that if they all get together, they can update this thing to provide more privacy to users. However, we've already put up their spying guide because they also make exception for what they'll have to tell the government if they get this underway. So there's still this catch-22 that they'll have to reveal what you're doing to authorities, we call it. But the main thing is that it's still the fox in the hen house. These are people who are already doing this and will shape the law to fit their interest, as they did Kalia. So we'll watch it and see what happens. And so we've got some of the best of um, the public interest groups around EFF, EPIC. You know, in fact, ACLU, just go down the list of the most distinguished public interest orgs, working with them on this. So we'll see what comes out of it. But, you know, in, in past cases, these groups have fought these corporations in court. And so we'll see what's up. 
Well, certainly it's, it's, it's hopeful and uh, people should, should have their eye on things like that. And certainly I'll be checking that out as soon as we uh, get offline here. But um, I, I guess uh, that it, it, it is hopeful, but we also have to be temp- temper that with, uh, with a reality check and, and realize uh, just how far these, these types of proposals can go. And uh, I, I guess the, the question is ultimately, uh, John Young, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the possibility of really opening up society and, and getting rid of the, uh, the secret? Well, I'm optimistic when when I deal with uh, people who help us. I'm pessimistic when I see the the authoritarians try to clamp down on that and talk about, oh, you're going too far, or we don't want to go that far, or again, this favorite thing, you're putting the nation at risk. And this kind of kowtowing to other authoritarians by authoritarians is kind of insufferable. And so uh, we don't trust the Icelandic government, for example. We would trust Icelanders, but not the government. Governments have us unfortunate self-interest in their own survival, and they will cut up whatever deals they have to with other governments to survive. So we are a strong believer in democracy and challenging uh, authority, and uh, so I'm optimistic about that. We seem to be moving in the right direction on that with a few setbacks every now and then. How can people best help uh, Cryptome.org? Set up their own site and run it and spread the word and uh, make sure that there's not just one or two sites doing this, that there are hundreds of them, and it will bring about change. Because the thing that governments fear more than any, or authorities fear more than anything else is the populace, the uncontrolled populace, and that their various attempts to manage them are not working. And uh, so that the best thing to do is to not rely upon a few key sites, but set up more sites and fund them, including your own. And, and be skeptical of any site that's been around for a while. And we caution people, don't believe what Krypton does, because we... We get deceived too, and we might have an interest you don't know about. Well, that that is the best possible answer to that question, and it's a philosophy that I subscribe to wholeheartedly. And I, I always encourage people to uh, to start to start doing this for themselves because uh, there's nothing special in what I'm doing, and to a certain extent, there's nothing special in what you're doing. But you certainly are doing it well, or you seem to be. So um, I, I hope people will take that those words to heart and will start. Uh, helping out in the sense of uh, joining the joining the struggle. So, uh, John Young, thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me today. Thank you for asking me.